Okay, we're back with Mark Leather for part two. He told me he had limited time last time, but by the length of his answers, he definitely didn't share with that. So I'm looking forward to uh, more long answers as well on this one, Mark. So okay. going straight back into it. So we were midway through your time at Liverpool last time. <clears throat> and one thing that I know that we've spoken about previously, and it was quite big at that time, was Michael Owen's emergence. So if you just talk about when he came through, like how you, what, what was your involvement in that? Well, initially, nothing at all, really, because while he was, um, you know, I suppose maturing as a younger professional player, he was at the Lillishall National School, the FA National School, where they were trained and lived and schooled down in the Midlands. And so we didn't really see much of him at all, other than... I think the FA Youth Cup games, when they got to a point of being of interest, so quarterfinals, semi-finals, and the final. So we'd see him play in those games. And I think the first time I saw him play was on television for the England schoolboys. Um, and as anyone would say, really, at that level, um, when you're really one of those top players, you stand out like a country mile, which he did. You know, and uh, you'd watch him play, and he was fantastic. But within a group of his peers, which is a bit false in many ways, no disrespect to the other lads in that team or well, that squad, but he was streets ahead of most of them. And then we saw him in the Youth Cup games. Um, and again, a similar thing, really. The opposition was, was good in those latter stages of that competition um, with probably really good players, um, but some of which will have gone on to probably to play for their countries as well. But he, he was just a, a standout person, really. And you didn't need to be a coaching badge or a, um, you know, a football guru to understand that he was, he was a quality, uh, quality footballer. And he then reported uh, for pre-season training um, to Melwood with the first team and that's when we got our first um, glimpse of him but he probably didn't like me the first the first week um, and I've mentioned it to him in, since then over the over the times that when he was in the club subsequently um, was that we used to have a couple of days maybe a week of some physical stuff um, alongside the football training and so one of the things we did at the time was a was the you know the intermittent yo yo test the bleep test type of uh, drill which was just um, an estimation of where they were up to with their aerobic capacity and everybody did it and we would have the heart rate monitors on and we would observe them till they dropped out and record what level they've done and then look at the heart rate into uh, consideration with the level that they got. <clears throat> so clearly, you know, there is an element of some of this is how reliable is it? I don't know, but it was a, it was a tool we used at the time, just as a two or three things really, was to see if it was reasonably reliable, uh, measuring the aerobic capacity and uh, also the mental side of it. You know, it's a bit soul destroying to just keep hearing bleeps. <laughs> Start of level six, boom, boom, just one after the other. It's not the most interesting thing to do. And even if you're fit, would you really be that bothered and maybe step out and would assume that that's okay? And you might have got a good score, actually. Uh, but the beauty of the heart rate monitors was that <clears throat> whenever you've dropped out, we'd have an estimation of your maximum heart rate. And if, you, if you're chucking out at 15, 16 on a bleep test, which is very good, but your heart rate's only 140, then there's many more bleeps in the tank. So equally, you could do 15 or 16 as a footballer and um, you step out and your heart rate's 190, which is clearly you're up to where you were before or the maximum really um, that, you can, that you can do. And as long as you've got some baseline information from, equally you could drop out at 15 or 16 and your heart rate's so high and yet 
last season you were able to cover 18 or 19 on a bleak test. So they're covering less, but the heart rate is still extremely high. Now that could be a sign of just not as fit as they should be, or maybe illness, fatigue, or viruses, etc. So um, off they go. A bit like the Grand National, you know, off the runners and riders are ready, we're off. And it's like up and down the pitch. And we've got spotters on the line to make sure they have to put the foot there. Three warnings, then you're out. If you don't get such a level, you'll be doing it again. Uh, the usual punishments and things like that to, to sort of encourage them to do a bit more. And uh, I think what he did was he thought, I'll have a look at two or three of the good runners and see where, where they get to. And so it was becoming a little bit harder and then a bit harder still. And some of the stragglers are out early on, you know, swollen fetlocks and bruised hooves, they're out. And then you get a bit of nitty gritty at the end. And so I can't remember exactly what level he did. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't bad, but I was a bit surprised because I'd already got the information from Lily Show. We don't tell them that, but it's there. And so he's stepping out, smile on his face, breathing, level 14, 15, whatever it was. That's good. So didn't say anything to him. And then there was a three or four left. McManaman did the highest I've ever seen on a bleak test. Um, there's just him left. And he's going and going and going. And then just walked off. Just stopped. Level 19 or 20. Something really, really hard. And he was a, a, a national 1,500-metre uh, middle-distance runner, um, was Steve McManaman. So he was fit. <clears throat> and uh, very fit in terms of those sort of uh, exercise bouts. And so there was a mixture, a mixture, as I said, some really good ones and some poor ones, and ex two or three excellent. And uh, I just thought, just have a word, Michael, and mark his card. So I'm just have a word with you, pop in. I said, it's not bad, that. I said, but you've done better than that. And he said, oh, I, don't, I can't remember. I can remember. And pulled out the documents. Lily Show, whenever it was, you know, February, six months ago, you did 16.5, not 14.2. Whatever the, the things were, I said, so your heart rate's indicating that there's more in the tank from that. It's supposed to be a maximum test. So um, see you again Thursday. We'll do it again. Not on his own. There was a few other people doing it. And he did it again, and he gets up to his, and beyond what he did at Lily Show. And it was a little word of warning that, you know, you need to forget what you've done there. This is important, but be wary that, you know, senior players are interesting that they can teach you a lot of good things, but the wrong senior player can spread not so good things to do. And so if you listen to the right senior players, they'll tell you to just do everything as best you can. Look after yourself. Don't listen to anybody. You know, you just do what you need to do for yourself. And um, I think we had a few at Liverpool that might have been, as we said in the last um, little chat, that, you know, there was a few that maybe the writing was on the wall for them and maybe not saying too complimentary things about the coaching staff or whatever, the club generally. But you need to distance yourself from that and focus yourself on what you really need. And uh, he was fine after that. He was uh, a really, really nice lad from a great family. And he deserved every accolade he got, in my view. He was, he was a top draw footballer and uh, a really nice lad to go with it as well, which is unusual, you know, because in elite sport, there's a lot of selfishness that's rightly so to some degree, but they're so focused. And they forget to do the nice things, saying hello to people and thank you and please and looking after staff or looking after the laundry lady or the canteen staff. But he was a top draw, top draw uh, lad and he obviously had a great career. Mm. And in terms of he had a few injury problems, <clears throat> like did they, were they... Did he? Training though? <laughs> did he have any injury problems? I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... He did. He, his injury problems really started 
with his well um, documented hamstring injury, um, where you know there's various ways of looking at the causes of injury and the risk of injury. Um, but I think I said this uh, last week in in a, in a, in a context of you know it's not rocket science. What we all do is not rocket science. A lot of it is common sense. So this lad didn't do um, an apprenticeship scheme at Liverpool Football Club. So the way they were developed at the football club was completely different probably than the way they were developed at Lillyshaw. And then Lillyshaw, they are moving around and travelling a lot more frequently probably with games um, invited to play in competitions all over the place. So um, the whole working day, working month, um, just that uh, transition from being a young adult into a man, uh, sorry, a young child into a young uh, adult, into a man virtually, you know, is going to be different. So um, I think it was a big step up to be going from Lillyshaw National School into Liverpool's first team. That's what he did. And at the same time as he did that, he's playing for England, senior team. If you check the records, I don't think he played many under-21s or a few under-18s, but it didn't, he didn't have that transition straight into the senior team, which they always say it's they're good enough, they're old enough, um, perhaps. But each step you make up the ladder, there's a big bridge between, well, a big gap between each stage. And sometimes it's too big a jump, technically, too big a jump tactically, or too big a jump physically um, for certain people. And my view from, from the club's point of view was that you needed to be careful of the numbers of games that he was playing. Uh, we needed to be a bit more proactive in pulling him out of fixtures. Um, squad rotations, call it what you will. But it's easy for me to say that um, when I'm not the manager or the coach. Um, because, you know, the, his first season um, was under Roy's Evans regime. And we weren't blessed with a massive number of strikers. We got Robbie Fowler out with a posterior cruciate ligament problem, you know, um, out for quite a few months uh, with surgery. And Ian Rush had gone. Um, John Barnes had probably come, you know, he's a midfield player with not really blessed with a lot of strikers. And so there was a, a almost a, a, an acceptance that temporarily, at least, Michael Owen would step into the shoes of uh, Robbie Fowler while he was injured. And then when they were fit, we've got a We've got two guys. Stan Collymore was around at the time. And so you've three. Um, but of course, you're a victim of your own success because then he's playing well and he's scoring goals and he's giving something that uh, other players would dream of is the speed. Not necessarily maximum sprint speed in a straight line, but a speed to react and move over that five metres to get away from defenders. And scoring became easy. Um, and so when the promised um, rest periods were coming, not for him, international duty, off you go, come back, back into Liverpool's team, it, it, it fed this perpetual uh, cycle of playing too many games, not enough recovery, musculoskeletally growing, um, posturally changing on a regular basis because that's what people do. Uh, when they're going through various growth spurts. And then it culminated, really. So he'd had no real injuries at all. Maybe the odd uh, soft tissue tightness, but nothing related to hamstring problems. And then he played a game at Leeds at Ellen Road, and the rest is history with that. It's a well-documented, you know, it's the equivalent of Usain Bolt sprinting and pulling up, holding the back of his hamstring, which... Sprinters do it all the time. And it was towards the end of the season and um, that finished his season, really. Rightly so, because now you can give him a long period of rest. 
rehabilitating and a very careful, controlled pre-season? No. Because we've changed of managers and bits of other circumstances changed and there was this desire, I think, and I can see why, that, you know, you want everybody back to make your mark in pre-season, want everybody back in pre-season. And, um, and of course, my view was that he wasn't uh, ready to do the amount of work you were going to do with him. And neither really did he need it. What he really needed was his own programme. But at that time, going back to 1998, I think it was, um, you know, coaches didn't want to do that. And they became very sort of dogmatic in a way that you have to do this and that. And that's probably been thrown at me, to be dogmatic, you know, inflexible. Well, on certain things, yes, yes. Because why would there be a problem with Michael Owen's injury Then there's not been a problem in the previous five years that I've worked at the football club with any player's injury? Why would this be a problem? Because he's possibly telling me to do something that really I don't think is right. I'm not in the best interest of the player. And in a nutshell, that was it. Coaches want him to do something. And um, at that time... I didn't think he was ready to do that. That's not Mark Leather's opinion. It's Mark Leather's opinion based on bigger experts than I'll ever be. So radiologists, the state of your MRI scans, the state of healing, looking at the picture as a whole, uh, his posture, his back, his pelvis, his hamstring strength, all kinds of stuff that we would do. Biomechanical gait analysis, 3D this, 3D that. But of course, it's irrelevant if you're ignoring what the signs are. And surprise, surprise, he broke down in pre-season training in the first week. Um, so he was never really ready to do that. And it became, for me, a bit of a dilemma, really, that I don't, I'm not really comfortable in being pushed into these you know, decisions. I'm not really comfortable in taking a risk when you don't need to take a risk. If it was the FA Cup final and there's a touch and go issue with a hamstring injury, of course you would. You'd tell the players a risk, you'd pull it again. Uh, but you probably would do that uh, for one off. But not at the beginning of the season before we've even kicked the ball. He didn't really need to do seven weeks of pre-season. What he really needed to do was his own bespoke programme for three or four weeks and then join in for two or three games, score six goals, Open game of the season, bang two in the in the back of the net, off we go. Who'll know whether it could have been like that? We'll never know. Because um, he then obviously had got a recurrence of that injury and it plagued him for a good while, which was the reason why I said you need to be careful in the first place. Because the biggest soft tissue injury frequency and uh, severity is hamstring injuries. Somebody once told me very early on, once a hamstring, always a hamstring, meaning that there's a high re-injury rate. And so that's why if I was being cautious, I was being possibly ultra cautious, given the value of the player, given the age of the player, given all this history of each season, not each season, but you know, virtually every step up is a very short period before he's taking another step and another step. And I felt that that was unfair on the player. And, you know, we had to then have a decision, do you stay and put up with this? And I felt the time was right to go. So and is that a, you falling out with the manager at that point then over this? Then were you having these discussions? I wouldn't, yeah, there was always an undercurrent. You know, I mean, the guy came, you know, he was, him and his family were, you know, local to where... I was in holiday in Cornwall because we just my wife just had a baby, and I didn't want to be burdening one of the other physios in the club to be having to face these decisions. So for a week, you know, I treated him every day, twice a day for a week to keep on top of every, yeah, um, to so his family came down to stay where we were near, near to where we were staying. 
you know, we were in, a, you know, a, a tent, and he was in a big mansion house. You know, that's the way it is. You know, so it's just I didn't. We weren't in a tent, and he wasn't in a mansion house. But it, it was. We got to know each other reasonably well in that time, and I think everybody appreciated what you were doing. But I think they also knew that there is that element of pressure that's being exerted. And it was difficult for the parents, probably, and an 18-year-old boy to, to, to deal with that. But I'd had enough, really, to be, to be honest. It, it was a stage where I'm not justifying putting a nice pack on somebody's knee. I'm not justifying to, to somebody about what exercise to do and what not to do. I mean, it's like me saying to the coach, I won't be playing him. What system are you playing today? That's bollocks. No, you need to do this, you know. You don't do that. It's not your job. And uh, I felt if that was what we, you know, if and it wasn't like that, don't get me wrong, but he was quite forceful, the manager, and, you know, that he, he felt that this was the right thing to do, what he wanted to do. And if I honestly felt that it was safe to do that and appropriate to do that, I'd have gone with it, but I didn't. And I didn't want to be compromised professionally and also in the dressing room. I think when you're being expected to, you know, physio's role is trust, confidence, um, and respect. And they're all earned by different things. And I felt very sad that I had to make that decision to to leave the club. Uh, and I wasn't really prepared to go back under different circumstances and we'll do this and we'll do that. It was a time was right to go and it was tough because lots of things were printed about me in the newspapers and I wanted to maybe answer those things and I didn't answer anything because I was opening a can of worms because if you say something to one with then somebody else will shift in with that comment it's just a domino effect so I didn't I didn't do that I held the council but anyone that that knows me um, was at the club at the time knew exactly what went on and you move on and then I left Liverpool and went to a much bigger club. Well, we'll come up in a second. We'll just go. So those reports then, was that just about your, say, um, questioning your handling of his injury? Well, I think, I think when, he, when the manager went into the newspapers to explain why the situation was what it was and what they were going to do with the player, in a roundabout way, it implied that they weren't getting the best treatments or the best advice. It didn't say that, but the implications were there. Mm. And then that, I felt, was not the right thing to say or do. And that really, um, I sought, a, you know, obviously, legal advice as to what to do. And just for clarity, really, it, it sort of helped me in a way to make my mind up, mm. um, which I did. But there was never you know, there was never any sort of real animosity between myself and, and, and the manager. And, and, you know, I've seen him after the event over the years at matches when I was at Sunderland and he was still the manager of Liverpool. You'd shake his hand and speak to him. And uh, I saw him not long ago, really, um, a few few years back in, in Liverpool, funny enough, in a, in a restaurant. And, you know, we had a chat, mm. arms around each other, shook his hand and can you move on? You know, you, you you move on, and I think you, life is too short to be negative about things. And I think also, um, when you step out of a goldfish bowl, which football is, you honestly, and I'm sure he probably reflects, and I know he has done uh, with people, because I've uh, I've been told the the case that it wasn't handled well. We shouldn't have really got to that point, and we shouldn't really. Because I respected the guy from bringing in some really good ideas, but um, I just thought it, it was too big a, an issue because I, I felt that there was, you know, needless pressure being put on you to to make bold statements about players that you can't do that. You can't guarantee nobody will get injured. You can't get, guarantee that they will get injured. You, you know, you just don't know. There's so many factors going on, but. Um, it, you know, it was it it, it 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 it's what it is, and I've moved on from that, and I had a another great career, carrying on doing other clubs and lots of other different jobs, and 
um, it's not the way I would have liked to have gone because it's all a bit, you know, when it's in the public domain, it's not, it's not nice to, to, to get involved in that, really. Mm. Do you think when you get to that point, though, so you say that you don't want to be there anymore, does, do you think he probably agrees with that because it's gone too far? No, I don't think he did. And I think he was surprised it went that far. Because I honestly believe by the fact I was asked to go back on three occasions um, to try and iron out the problems. But I didn't, I didn't feel that things were going to change. Because ultimately, I believe in that. And maybe he believes in that. And it's a big gap. And I can't, you know... Uh, I've worked at every level of football and worked with loads of coaches and loads of teams and loads of players. And I think they would all, players certainly, and the staff that I've worked for would say that they would trust you. They might not like your personality. That's a different thing. They might not, you know, they might not like you as a person, but they think you're decent at your job. Um, you might not go out on the players and get drinking with them, you know, things like that, which I, which I didn't very rarely would I do anything like that because it was just not me. But it wouldn't alter the decision of making decisions and judgments. It wouldn't question your ability on doing the job. Um, so really, at the end of the day, you've got to make your own choice. And I did and uh, moved on from it. So yeah, what, what happened next and where, where did he move on to? Well, the, this was obviously in the summer, um, the end of summer, beginning of the season, really, when it was all sorted out. And to be honest, I didn't really... I'd, I'd actually got a job to go to, in a way, if I wanted it, um, back, in the, back in the earlier summer. Um, so I went to work for a company called Total Fitness in, in Wilmslow and uh, helped to set up some of the facilities that are probably still there to this day. You know, a, a, a great health club uh, and a uh, German uh, physio centre, rehab centre that was uh, with me and a guy called Andy Clark, who Andy and Phil uh, Clark, uh, rugby guys from uh, from the Wigan area, and Clarky, Andy Clark was our fitness coach at Liverpool. Great lad. You know, lovely, lovely family, great people. And they were at Total Fitness as well, Phil and Andy. And I stayed there for not very long, actually, till Sam Allardyce asked me to go to, uh, to Bolton Wonders. You know, the bigger club uh, than Liverpool. You know, I'd moved up from Liverpool into, into Bolton. Yeah, Mark is a Bolton fan, if you haven't already gathered that one. So. I am the only one left. <laughs> So we go into Bolton then. So what was the state of their sports science setup then? Well, the manager had only just come into the to the job from Notts County, and I know Sam from days at Preston um, when he was a, a youth coach there uh, temporarily, and then assist, a caretaker manager when I was a physio there. So we we got him really well, and I liked him as a person. And I thought he's a good coach and a good man manager. I, you know, he's a good guy. And um, it was a no-brainer, really, to to go back into to to football because it, I felt it was a good time f for Bolton um, and for myself, really. So I had a good two years to start off this this sports science uh, evolution at Bolton, um, um, which I did. Um, he was very proactive on certain things that he wanted and he had people in uh, to do various things um, that were on the uh, sports science side of things, the sports psychology, which was fine. You know, the lads uh, came in and did the stuff and um, educated staff and educated players. And, and then we moved on with maybe more full-time staff. Uh, he changed around one or two things in the academy and um, it was really exciting times. Um, but after two years, I mean, we did well. You know, we did well in that. We got we we lost a, a playoff final, semi-final against Ipswich, 
over two legs. Um, and that would have got them into the Premier League a season earlier than they actually did. Uh, we got through to the FA Cup semi final at Wembley. Um, we lost on penalties against Aston Villa. Um, on the last occasion of the semi finals and final being played at the old Wembley, which was fantastic. Um, to uh, you know, to see to see Bolton in that in that environment. But of course, at Liverpool, we'd played Bolton in the in the Coca Cola Cup final. While I was working for Liverpool, I'm um, playing against the team I'd supported. So that was a a, a can of worms for trouble. So it, which it was really. Bolton played really well, you know, um, and the only difference was Steve McManaman on the day um, but of course Ronnie Moran didn't like my Bolton shirt on in the dressing room rubbing the players and putting the strappings on uh, he thought it was you know heresy to be doing that what are you doing that for? Disgrace uh, not a disgrace only should a trotter you'll always be a trotter and so it was. The players loved it, of course, because I was always getting shouted at, and uh, it was a great day out, you know, t for Bolton. And it ended up, I think, that was, you know, Bruce Riot was the manager of Bolton then, and he did really well for the club for um, for a, a real good period of time, actually, uh, from the old third division into that uh, second division, and then he obviously went to Arsenal, but. You know, for me, um, the Bolton Sam Allardyce really set this, and it was something I'd always been interested in. You know, the fitness side of things, uh, not just the injury sort of things. Working people pre-season, taking squads, doing you know the physical side of it, rather than not to do with the football side of it, um, but getting people fitter and stronger and bigger and you know fit for purpose of what they were expected to do on the pitch and, and Sam was a big believer in that and um, backed it up with technology and equipment and, and resources and then um, so after two good seasons really um, I, I possibly should have stayed at Bolton but I got poached to go to uh, with Peter Reid uh, at Sunderland and had Three good seasons up there, you know, four seasons. I can't remember now. Mm. Um, but and that was open mark. So when when you have that initial chat with Sam Allardyce, then does he outline his plans that he wants to create a physical team? And do you have a, a, almost a more senior <coughs> role than being physio? I, I think he gave me more of a senior role than my job title probably was really, because I think he knew that you'd got or you'd been privy to quite a lot of things to at a. At a club like Liverpool, and the, they do talk, obviously, and managers and coaches and players will talk. And I think he'd always see me at Preston in a similar mould, really, of never frightened of working players and making it making it hard. But it, it was always pretty sensible and straightforward, and being, you know, motivation and the psychology of dealing with footballers and. You know, being a counsellor if you need to be, or being the school teacher if you need to be that way. And I think he liked my views on all those things. And clearly, from that period where more sports science was just beginning to come in with a lot of nutritional um, advice and strategies, um, and I'd done a master's degree um, at John Moore's University in sports science. So I'd got I wasn't just talking a good game. I'd got some academic stuff to back it up. And I think he wanted to tap into that as much as I wanted to tap into what he was doing. And uh, I think he, he, was a, he was ahead of his time. And, and he persuaded the club just when I was there, but more after, over a longer period of time, when they were in the Premier League for 10 seasons, to invest on the on the sports science and medical side of things to a higher level than they'd ever done before because the costs still were insignificant to buying a footballer that never kicks a ball for you on a four-year deal on 10, 15, 20,000 pounds a week. Now you can say 30, 40, 50, 60, 100, 200, 300,000 pounds a week. 
you know, it's a massive mistake, massive cost if you pick a wrong player like that. And that would keep all your backroom staff. I mean, Sam's, you know, famous for having more backroom staff on, on, on the team bus than the players. You know, players will have to make their own way there. Staff are on the coach now. So it wasn't like that. Of course, staff had to jump in vans and cars and do what they needed to do because the coach wasn't big enough. But that's what he believed in. And really, his results speak for himself. So do you think that, that, why do you think that more teams, I mean, there's definitely the teams have grown massively since then, but do you think that that is a good way to go in terms of the investment? Not really. If you, get, if you don't know what you're doing with it, or you're getting confused with it, or you're getting mixed messages, or you're getting too many staff saying too many different things. Because ultimately, it, you know, Peter Reid said to me once that about, it's about team selection. When there's, when there's very little to choose from, it, it might be bad, but actually it's good because you, you haven't got any decisions. It's like, that's your squad. We've only 13 fit players, whatever it is. You know, you only two to leave out the team. When you've got a squad of 25 and 30, you're forever probably putting fires out with people and having conversations why they're not in the team. And I think if you're not careful, a department can be too big. You lose, you know, everybody thinks they've got a role to play, which they do, but you've got to, in my view, have a, have a, have a, a real strict sort of, um, people might call it philosophy or a working practice or, a, you, you know, what are you hoping to achieve and who's going to do these things that will make these little pieces that make the whole. And I think he was very good at, um, you know, making people accountable, responsible for things. And that followed me into my departments of, of this medical and sports science team was giving ownership to people to do, but have a two-tier system really of all the information and data that you're collecting. Um, you know, the real numbers and the, the wealth of that needs to be kept away from coaches and kept away from players. And then just the bullet points, the main things that you're looking for or the, the, the parameters that, you, that you're measuring, just give them that with a, a green for good, amber for might be all right, might not be, and then the reds, knackered, finished. You know, they're not fit, blah de blah whatever it was. And I think when it's like that, the, the, the medium in which the coach gets that information is somebody like myself or somebody in a, a head of department role that can almost trust the people putting together the reports to come up with the succinct basic information and recommendations and then that lands on the coach's desk and is usually in my role will be um, the bad news monitor as I've been called before here he is again the bad news monitor um, would you come to this club I'd like you to come to this club well that'd be all right what's the job you, the bad news monitor you, you do the bad news and I'll do the good news why would they do that Anyway. Yeah. Um, so for that, what was it like being the, well, working for a club that you support? Did that change anything? Um, I don't think it did, really. I, I think I used to play on that, that, it's, that you're a supporter of the team and, you know, and kiss the badge of the shirt every morning before you started treatment. Just remember who you're playing, lads, who you're representing, the town, and get the, they used to think, you know, the foreign players used to think, who is he, this guy? But well, I think the, the good, you know, the British lads used to think it was quite funny, you know, that, um, you, you know, you. I can remember the first time I saw Chungi and Lee. You know, Chungi, what a lad. You know, great player. Really nice lad. And he's obviously Korean. His English is pretty good. But sometimes his sense of humour misses with him. And the first day at the club at Bolton, um, I said, I said, hey, I said, Chungi, I just have a word with you. And he went, yeah. I said, can I tell you, you were one of the best footballers that I've ever seen play for Bolton Wanderers. I love you. And he's looking at me. 
but I did. He was a great lad, and we used to play on. So I think players like it when you've got a bit of a passion for the club, because ultimately they're, they're football people. They understand that. Mm. And um, I don't think it ever changed my attitude to dealing with players, you know, individual players with uh, at Bolton. No, I think they were, you know, they were, you just make the right decisions professionally and the right advice always. You know, they are you know, the patients in a way, if you're a physio, or, you know, you've got a big responsibility, so even from the, from the sports science and fitness side of the thing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do any players any harm or, you know, drop them in situations because you're a supporter. But I think they did, I think they do like that when they know you're a bit of a, uh, a bit of a fan. Mm. Um, and certainly the, um, the Bolton lads were, you know, in the first time with the club, were really good. I remember Sam said, right, we're going out for a night out to initiate you. You're the new member of staff. So we roll up in Manchester to an Italian restaurant. Chairman's out. Directors, Brett Warburton, Phil Gartside. We have a meal. They're all there. Uh, right, leather on the table. Singers the Bolton songs from the 70s because he used to play in the 70s. Thought he was a good player. And uh, which he was in a good team actually. They were, you know, it was a great time for Bolton. The when Ian Grease was the manager in the in the in the in the in the late seventies. And um, so I used to sing a few songs. That was my initiation. And then every so often you have to do them again. And then he asked me to pick his best Bolton eleven once, which I did, but I didn't pick him. I played a bloke called Dave Sutton, who played after this great team and. I don't know Dave Sutton really well, but he, he was a centre half, but they weren't that good the team. Um, but I remember him, and, and uh, I said, uh, I said Paul Jones is centre half, and um, Paul Jones is one of the best footballers I've ever seen play. Fantastic player. Who played alongside at Sam as centre half for Bolton, and I said playing alongside him will be Dave Sutton. And the manager's face dropped. Sutton, he can't kick a bloody ball. What's he doing in the team? I said, well, you're a sub. I said, but as John McGrath would say, you're not just a sub, you're a blooming good sub. And so we had a lot of players like all that, maybe having a bit of a mess about with the coach. But mm. um, I don't. Th I felt a bit, you know, in the sad times at Bolton recently, you know, when um, you were going into administration, it, it was unpleasant for everybody. Um, but as a supporter, you feel really sad that your club's ended up like that. Mm. So what made you want to move on from Bolton then? Well, the, the director of football operations at Sunderland was a guy called Mark Blackburn, who I'd worked with at Burnley, as he was the club secretary at Burnley, so he knew of me. Uh, Sam and Peter Reid were very close, and I think Reedy wanted a uh, a change in the physio department or the sports science department um, because they were it wasn't just a job I think it was it was more to do with uh, designing and help designing um, the Academy of Light training ground which if you've been up there people have seen it you know it's a fantastic setup um, and I was privileged to get involved in that and I think that side of it was just as interesting as the as the day-to-day -day work within football. So we uprooted the, the family and uh, we moved up to the North East and I thoroughly enjoyed, you know, th the three seasons, uh, five years we lived up there, but three seasons working there. Um, but the club was going through a bit of another difficult time, really. Um, we'd sort of built the training ground and then we're kitting the thing out properly. And then it almost on the pitch, performances were dropping um, and we lost some good footballers really at Sunderland and you know it was a tough time um, where the club ended up being relegated over two seasons really it was a gradual uh, decline and the stadium of light the, the academy of light was really um not fully finished as it should have been really at the time and it was it was a bit sad that but when I say that it was just bits of equipment that that we were going to buy we didn't get in the end but I mean the facilities were fantastic it's a great training ground and a great club yeah. you know massive support 
And so uh, I enjoy going up there. But I am like that. You know, as much as you support the club, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't stop me from going to play. I haven't done go to other clubs and do this now. Really, it's not like a, you know, if you talk to the guys uh, that go watching, say Bolton or any team, they they can't maybe see that. How can you go and work for another team? Well, it's my job. And you might change your job as an engineer and go and work for another company. It's no different for me, really. Mm. So moving and leaving doesn't it never really bother me. Yeah. Um, no, the Academy of Light was an amazing facility, certainly from, from back then. It's, yeah, it's very yeah. So after Sunderland, then, what happens? Um, well, after Sunderland, um, you know, the... Um, the end of the season, um, we were relegated, and um, we'd been through three managers in in a year. And I think the time was probably right again. You know, um, the y- your shelf life really um, for most people is I don't know three five years, uh, maybe getting shorter than five years now. Um, well, you've got to do what you feel right, and I felt. You know, it was all full on at Sunderland. It was a, a, you know, big three years, three years in the Premier League. And, you know, it was um, for a club like that as well that were not historically one of the top five clubs, like a Liverpool, for example. Um, they were fighting all the time to, get to, to not be guilty of this overachieving, which they finished seventh, I think, two seasons running. And then suddenly it was a bit lower than that and then culminating in the relegation. So I think um, they financially probably did the right thing, actually, and that would go through a line of salaries across the board, and anyone below that or above that, in that band, if you like, if you're below it, you're safe, but if you're in that band, then um, you were at risk. And I just told them, fine, you know, pay me up and I'll be off. And then I remember doing nothing for months, three months. I said, end of the season, that's it. I'm going to do nothing. And I didn't. I just, I walked the pen I wear with a good mate of mine, Mark Nile, who'd been, uh, I think he'd left Leeds, actually, physio as well. So we had a good week, 10 days walking the pen I wear. And then chilled out for the summer. And then I think it got to about August where my good lady wife said, in the nicest possible way, you need to get a job and get out from under our feet. And I said, what's that? She said, because life for the last X number of years, 10, 15 years, has, has, been, has gone on swimmingly well when you're not around and you're around too much. You're cluttering the place up and you, you just need to get a job, which was probably right. And that's a difficult one then because you're thinking, you know, what do you do? What do you want to do? And I have this blank piece of paper with loads of things I don't want to do. And not many things on it that I did. And but I knew I needed to earn some money. I've got three kids and a mortgage and everything else to pay for. So I, um, I decided that I would uh, work for myself, which I did for a period of time. I set up my own business from home. I did a lot of work for the FA on lecturing, teaching on courses and covering events. And then I did a lot of work for the England futsal team that had just been set up. And I enjoyed that and did that for seven years actually, um, which was um, a lot of traveling and uh, in a new game and I, I enjoyed that. And then I decided to do a PGCE I'd like the teaching and the lecturing. And I, I got a job at Teesside University for 12 months. And once I'd completed that, um, I got offered a job to go back to the Northwest, um, which was always on the cards, really, um, from the point of view of that I loved the Northeast and so did my wife, but it, it, the, the jobs in our area were really were few and far between up there. So it would have meant more traveling around to try and find jobs. And so to come back to the Northwest was, was a sensible thing to do. So I ended up, I'm just going to try and get out of the sun here a little bit. Can you still see me if I stand there? Sit there. Perfect. And um, 
I got the job head physio of the of Wigan Warriors, and I did that because I'd I'd never worked in rugby league, and I thought we could challenge this, and and it was like starting all over again. Um, but it was it was good. So where you, you know you got situations where you your mentality of the players was different than 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 footballers. Uh, far from encouraging people that they should be able to train and play, these guys you actually said, I don't think you should be playing in training. It was one you know, first game. You know, uh, those that's done rugby rugby um, league, you know, and you've been in football, it's a different environment being on the pitch. Game's going on. And we're running around, dodging about, and I thought, I better get some practice on this before the first league game, Catalan Dragons away. And so I went to uh, Wigan, Ince Rolls Bridge, I think they call themselves, and they let me let me run on, which was good, really, because I made a complete fool of myself, like going in the wrong places at the wrong times, but no one was watching, so it was just, who's that guy? Oh, he's Wigan Warriors head physio. Good, good luck to them. Crazy head physio. But then I don't know what he's doing. So I did my brief apprenticeship, two or three games, and then off to Catalan Dragons, which can only be described as a bloodbath. You know, I've got this guy with me who works in my own business now, actually, and he was a student at Teesside, and he lived in Manchester Way, and I said, I'll get you a job come in and do the massage and soft tissue and help me. So he got the job and uh, first game, pack all the boxes, get everything sorted out. And um, he'll be thinking, this will be interesting, you know, working with a, a well-known physio. Anyway, we get to the game and uh, it, it start playing the game. Anyway, it was like a war zone. People going down like, wildfire, you know, and picking up one and he's got concussion. He best come off. I'm not coming off and pushing you in your face. So, and one's ears hanging off. He's got his ear hanging off. He needs stitches. That far. I don't know, just put some Vaseline on there and stick, pad it up. Okay. And do that. Do what you want. And then we get F Fika Paliacina. Big, strong, garoon to the lad. He's, he's been caught out of position and he's the last line of defence, actually. And he has to try and trip up this winger. A big strapping fell. Tries to trip him up. Lands on his elbow. Rolling his elbow. And so I went on. And he says, so on the elbow. I says, let's have a look. And he went, I thought, his ligament's gone there. Completely gone, ruptured in, inside of his elbow. So he said, I'll "Just strap it up, I'll be all right." And I thought, "I will do, and you probably will be." Just strap it up, do everything that the players want to do. Not really professional, but what can you do? I sat down on this cool box, and Ben, the lad next to me, and uh, I said something to him along the lines of. You know, when you've been working for 20-odd years, thinking that you know what you're talking about and you're doing a decent job, I sat there and I said, you know what? I said, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. I have no idea. This is just a complete different game to me. But we'll move on. So the coach said, after game, what do you think of Fika? And I said, well, what I think is that that is a ruptured ulnar collateral ligament. It will need, at best... Uh, placing in a brace for a number of weeks or at worst surgery followed by another period of immobilisation in the brace and probably six to eight weeks, who knows I said but what's more likely to happen is he won't want surgery and he won't want to miss a game because he's a foreign player and they have to pay, play to get paid and if they don't play so many games then they don't, they're not allowed to be an overseas player. So the contracts are ripped up. So he'll probably be fit next week. And he was. So all the bruising and all the swelling, the only thing he, trust me, the only thing he didn't do was a lot of the conditioning work, lifting weights, right? But he didn't miss one game. 
he just had some treatment, strapped it up, and that taught me another thing, you know, the power of the brain and the mind when its needs must. Maybe we've, we've been far too soft at certain situations uh, in certain sports because that guy was just a rock. And he got through it, fine, carried on playing for a number of teams after that. And uh, he didn't miss a game. So, so how do you find that then? I mean, that is, I've heard that story, that is shocking. Like the, that, well, that. It, that's, you see, that it's, that's not unusual for rugby league. That, I'm sure that if you've got some rugby league physios or rugby union physios listening to this, that's part of the course. It's not par for the course to not miss games as such, but it's not par for, it is par for the course to be directed by what the player wants, what the player needs to do. And the medical side of it, I'll take my chances. I'm not, I've got a family, I need to do this, I need to play, I need to do that. And so the dilemma is always then um, balancing between what you think you know, is in the best interest medically or best interest from a psychological point of view and a personal problem, uh, personal situation, then that's what they want to do. And so, you know, you'd always say to the player, ultimately, it's on their responsibility. The advice was not to play. Ideally, would be to do this, uh, surgery or brace or repeat scans and et cetera. Um, but if they don't want to do that, it's a free world. You can't make them do it. The club could say, we're not playing you because the medical advice is that you want to play, but we're not playing you. But that, that wasn't the question, really. The question was the, play, the club are quite happy to let the player play in reasonable circumstances or train and play once. You know, what's your worst case scenario? It was ruptured anyway. It just means in the one game, he might have said, I can't, I can't throw the ball, I can't, I, can't, I can't tackle. Right, fine, you're not doing it again, off you go. But if he's, if he's managing to do it, um, it's just, uh, and he wants to do it, and he knows the rest, then that's what they did. Mm. So it was a, it was a, good, a good learning curve, really, that. So were you doing that alongside your work at Edge Hill then, or was that? No, I was full-time there, and then I went back, I went into teaching. Uh, in the university for seven or eight years, uh, uh, until seven years. And how did you find that transition of, of the... Well, I'd, I'd done the bit at Teesside for 12 months, and then I continued to do the England futsal team and some squad work uh, alongside my university teaching, and I enjoyed it. You know, I enjoyed the university. It's a nice campus, lovely place. Um, and I enjoyed my time there. Um and I would never have gone back into a football club full time to be uh, a full time physio in the treatment room. It was never me anyway in the first place, really. That, um, and so it was never an interest to do that. But the the role of sort of a uh, head of performance department uh, came up at Bolton, and, and I quite like the sound of that. Not that it was you know perform but yeah, performance. Who's putting words to that? What does it mean that? You know, you're head of medical and sports science, basically. And somebody that's got physio qualifications and experience and a master's degree in sports science and my sort of CV around it, I know I can do the job. That's not being big headed, but I won't be applying for something if I didn't think I could do the thing. What fool would do that? Why would you put yourself in a position if you can't do it? And so, it was a no-brainer, really, because at the end of the day, I've, I've already said about ownership and responsibility and, and accountability and having staff that's got good skill mix, good discipline, good teamwork, communication, all these things. And um, they were fantastic people uh, at Bolton, really good practitioners, really good physios, Steve Megson, uh, Matt Fox, you know, Steve Foster, you know, really good guys that did what they... Uh, you know, they were fantastic guys. Two good masseurs that were very organised, great with the players, Al Watmore and Dave Dean. You know, they, they were they were really good people. And conditioners like Dan Birdsell, you know, come from Morecambe, working off a shoestring of a budget. But they did really well. Well, get him in. He's used to having no money with the with, with to buy equipment and things. Um, a guy on the football pitch is Chris Short, one of the nicest guys I've met in football. 
really, you know, ex-player, uh, Craig Short's brother, uh, family of, you know, really good, principled, uh, honest uh, guys, and we had a really good uh, backroom staff, um, but a good working department. There was no massive egos to pull people out or oversee, but they knew that ultimately I'd have to make a decision. So it wasn't Mark Leather's calling the shots. Mark Leather's listening and trying to take the best approach with whatever it was. And, um, you know, for me, um, they were, they were, it was a really good period in my life. Um, I enjoyed that. And it sort of put my faith back into football to think, you know, it's not changed that much, but it has. But it's not changed to the point of where you can't do your job because a lot of it's dealing with people and it's using common sense. And if you can't communicate with people, motivate them, enthuse them, but be disciplined and you can't make decisions, or common sense decisions, you know, you have to sometimes go with that craft knowledge, as they call it. Like Peter Reed used to leave one or two people out of training. Niall Quinn and Kevin Phillips. But he didn't put that down to a GPS monitor or a heart rate score. He put it down to the fact that those are his best two players. And we can't be messing about with them. If we just, the odd day, you're not doing anything. Go and sit in the pool. Mm. Or don't come in. Stay at home. Knowing on Friday, they'll be ready for the set plays and the small-sided games. And on Saturday afternoon, Hughes and, uh, sorry, Phillips and Quinn. Two goals, winning it, win a game again. So, common sense. Um, I think obviously technology helps and equipment helps to a to a degree, you know, a good degree. So, you know, it's big to to make those things. But ultimately, if you look in somebody's eyes, they'll tell you whether they want to play. Mm. Tell you if they're injured. Or they might say they're not injured when they are. And in terms of like that psychology aspect, do you, did, did that help you when you went into teaching the, like the sports therapy students? Yeah, because I think that you you that you you have to you have to appreciate um, that these guys are young and they are very very. Uh, privileged to be playing the game and earning a lot of money and the lifestyle is appropriate they've got families, a lot of them and that being injured is obviously a serious problem if it's a serious injury because there's, there's a, this doubt and risk that their career is over despite what people say oh nine times out of ten and ACL is okay well is it? might be for a year what's it like in seven years, five years four years so there's always a risk and you never know whether you're going to be the one out of 10 that doesn't make it. You get the ones that we pick up where coaches have let them down. You know, they promise them things and they treat them badly. Not all coaches do that. And I'm not saying that from that point of view, but I've seen managers and coaches demoralise people and who's that left to pick up? Mark Leather will do that put their arm around them and try and turn a negative into a positive. But I'm like that anyway. I don't like feeling bad. I don't like feeling down. I don't like feeling negative. So my glass is always half full and I try and use everything as a challenge. And I think that's what I've said to them players at, at times like that. You know, it's two ways of going. You either climb up the ladder or you drop off it. Mm. So whichever way you're going to do, you let's go for the, more, the, the one that you feel better with. But that's demanding a bit of hard work. And I think they build that trust with them. And you don't just tell them things for thinking that's what they want to hear. You've got to give them the bad news and then the good news. And you've got to be organised with them and um, giving them some time away. Be flexible with them. But equally, when it's down to work, you need to work your bollocks off really hard. Should I say that? Right. You work your socks off, and maybe that, that's what I think it was just something a bit of interruption there. It sounded like that, but it was socks work your socks off. Um, because 
hard work never hurt anybody. And you feel better when you work hard. And then at the end of the day, if you're not good enough or, you know, you've not been able to come back from an injury, but you know you've given it your best shot, then you're not going to look back, which is another horrible thing in life to look back and think, I should have done this. I should have done that. I could have done this. If only I'd listened. It's not nice uh, being that way. Mm. I think in part one, I'd said, I'd never listened to teachers telling me what to do. And it was a gut-wrenching feeling to think they were right all along. And I think I knew it all at 17 years old. If only I listened, you know, to the to the right people. But I think that is part of your personality, your personal skills, and things that that you know that 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 come out with it in in that way, really. Mm. Well, yeah, I think that's a good note to finish on. Good lesson for life, as well as in uh, physio sport, anything really. So. We may come back for part three because I'm sure there's definitely more stuff, but we'll, uh, we'll maybe give you a few weeks off for that one. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been an absolute well, pleasure. Appreciate that, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Done.